Well, good evening, everyone. It is so great to be here with you tonight. Let's all stand together and begin this night worshiping our God. You may be seated. As Jack said, we welcome you to the second annual Be Ready Conference 2022. Yay! <laughs> we are so glad to have you here, and we say hello to all of our friends who are watching online from all over the place. Um, we are so glad that you are joining us, too. 
Um, just in case you don't know, my name is Shauna, and I have the joy and pleasure of being your MC for the weekend. So I will be up, down, up, down quite a few times over the next two days, so just get used to it. <laughs> I am loving it. All right, so as usual, we get to go over some fun details. Um, so first and foremost, always most important, are the restrooms. So if anybody needs a restroom, it's through these double doors in the back and to the right. And we did um, transform the men's bathroom into a women's bathroom. And so both can be used throughout the weekend. Uh, what else? Your schedule, if you didn't notice, is on the back of your lanyard. So behind your name tag, the whole schedule for the weekend is there for you. Also, um, you noticed, I know you noticed, that there are a lot of incredible men here on this campus tonight. Yes. We are blessed to have so many men who have been serving us throughout the planning of this whole event and who have been here for the last couple days working on this and who will be back early tomorrow morning and throughout this whole weekend. So as you see them throughout the weekend, if you want to thank them, I'm sure they would appreciate that, but we're, we're very grateful. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, I hope you enjoyed your dinner, Makayos. It's very good. Yes. Okay, so for those of you who might not be familiar with our campus, um, we had you in the worship center, which is where we normally hold our church services, but you may have noticed it's under construction currently. And so we made this room, which is our ministry center, this actually used to be a basketball gymnasium, and so this was transformed so that we could move over here while that is being constructed. And so that hopefully now you know the difference between the two buildings if you see it on your lanyard or in your program. Um, okay, and I think that is all of the fun details that I get to share. When I was thinking about um, the topic of this conference, uh, Unmet Expectations, I was very excited about the topic. and. I don't know about you, but I immediately thought about all of the times that I have not met the expectations of people that I love. And instead of selfishly keeping them inside and holding in my shame, I am choosing to share some of them with you. And as usual, I come with photographic evidence. <laughs> this time, I am the victim. So. The first example of when I have failed and not met the expectations is, of course, with my beautiful children. They asked me one night, not too long ago, if I would make them some blueberry muffins. And so I, of course, obliged them. And while they went to sleep, I began making out of a box all you judgy McJudgersons. <laughs> yes, I began making the blueberry muffins, which required me to turn on the oven, which was a feat in itself. And so I'm about halfway through the baking of these blueberry muffins, and lo and behold, what do I notice on the counter? But the blueberries. <laughs> the actual can of blueberries. Can you see it? Oh, you can't see it. Okay. Anyway, well, I had a picture of the blueberries. So the next morning, my children received muffins. <laughs> and they were sore afraid. Okay, next, my children were the target of more of these unmet expectations, probably many and many to come. But really, Crayola are the problem with, you know, that caused this unmet expectation. So Crayola... I bought this special Play-Doh-y stuff, I don't even know, and on the cover of the Play-Doh was a chameleon with, can you see it yet? Oh, yay, there it is. So Crayola set me up <laughs> for this expectation. First of all, that I actually bought that many colors, but secondly, for my children to say, mommy, can you make that for us? <laughs> Would you like to see what I made? <laughs> A 
absolute clear unmet expectation. You can all counsel my children at any time. So I have a group of friends who I have also failed to meet their expectations. They are all incredibly amazing and incredibly crafty, which is the exact opposite of what I am when it comes to crafting. I would kind of rather watch paint dry and maybe have a couple tetanus shots at the same time <laughs> than do a craft. But they decided that girls' night out was going to be craft night. I don't know how they still love me after saying that, but they did. And so their idea was to make fall wreaths. So I decide I can make a fall wreath. I'm going to go to the dollar store and show them that I can only, not only make one, but I can make it on the cheap. What I didn't realize is that my friends are amazing at all of this, and they went to the fancy stores, and they bought wreath items from out of a magazine. So when we went to make these wreaths, let me show you what they made. Are you all ready for what I made? They were just as shocked as you. That's what the dollar store gets you, ladies. Right there. Might not be in a magazine, but my grandma would have been proud. That is all I'm saying. So lastly, this one doesn't happen to be about me. I will say that. But there was a little girl at one time when she was about 10 years old. Her parents took her to a photographer, and they expected to receive a lovely picture of their sweet little girl. They did get that, but what they were not expecting was that this picture would also reveal her inner feelings of disdain for having to have said picture taken. <laughs> Let me show you. <laughs> now what's more glorious about this picture other than the old school 80s, old Owen Mills style picture behind me is that this is not just some random little girl. This is our very own faithful and wonderful leader of our women's ministry, Colleen Mattia. Come on up. And she is bringing up with her our faithful leader of family ministries, Curtis, with her. Thank you very much. Oh, I love that. You know, how many of you had a picture like that in the 80s? I mean, come on. That was, that was the thing back then. I would have put one up, but I've never taken a picture like that before. Sure. Angela, of where are I you? Have. Really? I have. I have. <laughs> well, I have to say, if that picture were taken of me today, the serious face would be thinking, has it been a year already since our last women's conference? Yeah, it is hard to believe. How many of you are here for the first women's conference we did last year? A lot of you. Yeah, there you go. We got a woo. One woo. <laughs> yeah, so we're so excited. This is our second annual women's conference. And, and, you know, when I think back over the last year, I just, even this, a, a moment like this is evidence of God's grace at our church and upon us for all of the wonderful things that he's done over the last year. So as we have, you know, prayerfully sought him, tried to be faithful, he has brought Colleen to be the director who does an absolutely phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Praise God. I've said this before, but one of my favorite things about Colleen in this role, she's gifted, she's experienced, she can do it really, really well, but it's her love for the Lord, her gracious mm -hmm. humility, and her love for you guys. And so really, really thankful for her. And God has built a core team, and there are so many of you that serve within the ministry. So this is a long, slow process. We're just going to continue to stay behind the Lord, and we'll keep walking it out. But even to see over the last year, all that God has done is just, um, just so encouraging for me personally. And, and we, we love you, and we really want um, you to have you know, environments you can be in where you know your love, where you can grow in your love for Christ. So we're really thankful to be here. We really are, and just evidence of 
of the faithfulness of the Lord is all of you here today, all of you joining online, um, and the many women who have joined us from our from local sister churches. We're so happy you're here, and even a group from our Henderson microsite. So where are you, ladies? Hey, there Hello. they are. <laughs> Yay! Welcome. They're live in person. Yes. Love it, love it. They literally just got in. Um, so we're so grateful for all of you. Yeah, such a blessing. And, and, you know, for us to be able to gather together like this is not just to do an event. That's not the heart behind it. Let's just do something for women. Our prayer and our hope is that God will, in this time, help all of us to love Jesus more. Mm -hmm. And if there's anybody here who doesn't love him, our prayer is that by the end of this weekend, you would, that you would put your faith and trust in him, but that we would grow in our love for him, that we would leave becoming more like him, that the spirit and the word would wash over us and we would be encouraged and convicted and reminded and given hope through Jesus. And that I pray this would be a moment that you would be able to reflect back on over time. And remember the things that the Spirit is going to do in your life and in your heart, the truths that he's going to bring to bear in wonderful ways in your hearts and in your minds. And so it really is such a wonderful opportunity for us. And, and, and please know, um, there's a few pastors here. Um, there's a few that couldn't make it, but they're going to be stopping by. They love you. We love you. And we're so excited to be able to gather together. Is anybody excited, by the way? Yay! Yes. Good. So I'm not the only one. That's good. We're so excited about this weekend, and really what we're most excited about is Jesus, that, we, that Lisa Hughes, I'm so, I'm so thankful to have her here. You are going to be so blessed by her. She is going to present hope through Christ to us this weekend, so just be ready. It's going to be wonderful. No pun intended. Be ready. Right. Be ready. That's right. And I have to share, every woman who registered has been prayed for by name by the women's core team, by members of our prayer team. Uh, we've been praying for those of you who we don't know your names online. Um, so just know we've gone into this weekend intentionally seeking the Lord. And I'd love for us to have a time to do that together. Um, but before you do, I want, before we go to prayer together, I want you to look around the room. There are women surrounding you, your sisters in Christ are here. You have all things in common with your sisters in Christ. We share the same Holy Spirit. We serve the same risen Savior. We have the same hope. And so even if you came here tonight alone, not knowing anybody, you are with your sisters. So link arms, put your hands on somebody, come together. We're coming together in prayer right now. So if you want to hold a hand, you want to put your arm around your friends, your sisters, do that now. It's a ladies conference, guys. This is what we do, okay? All right. And now we are going to humbly seek the Lord. And you know, we would never do this at a men's conference. That's right. <laughs> this would never happen. Although Kyle and Jeremiah, they were holding each other. So that yes, was, that was that's a sweet. sweet. Moment. Yes, that is wonderful. so sweet. <laughs> but we are, we're going before the throne of grace together. Oh, Lord in heaven, we just thank you. We thank you that we can laugh. We thank you that we have joy because of your son. Thank you for every woman here Thank you for all of the women that are joining online. God, I pray that you would um, just go before, go behind. May your hand be upon every moment of this conference. I pray that all the responsibilities that have been left behind, I pray that you care for them. Lord, all of the kids, all the jobs, all the things, God, um, just give the women here peace in knowing um, that you have ordained this time for them. Lord, I pray for any women who may have come tonight and, and they're carrying a burden. I pray that you would give them comfort, give them peace. God, and we just thank you for hearing our prayer. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is for us to be able to gather together. Lord, as I look out, and I see all the souls that are in this room today. What a gift, Lord. That is your gift to us and to this time. And, and I pray that this time, this weekend, would be your gift to them. Father, please, will you uh, bless this time? Will you protect it from the enemy? I pray that fellowship would be sweet. I pray that your spirit would move and work in all of us. 
through your word, through the time of worship, through fellowship, through breaking bread together, Lord, that you would just bless this weekend. We don't want to do anything that's apart from you. This is all for you, Lord, and we pray that you would be lifted high and magnified and that we would be more worshipful after this weekend because we've gathered together in this way. And Father, I thank you for Lisa. I thank you for the, just the years and years and years of faithful service to you. I thank you for how you've gifted her. I thank you for her love and her humility and, and just her passion for your word and for women and, and that she is here this weekend. Our, our cup just runs over, Father. It's just such a gracious gift by you. So please, will you bless her? Will you strengthen her this weekend? Father, we pray that as, as she teaches your word, and this topic especially, Lord, I pray that, that there would be um, change, that, that eyes would see things, that we have blind spots, Lord. We, we need your help. Help us to see, help us to be encouraged and convicted. Lord, we, we know that, that this is what you do. And so we cry out to you and we pray that you would. I pray for the worship team. I'm so thankful for them and how they're going to be serving and, and helping us to worship you. Will you be with them? I pray for um, Jennifer, who's organizing all of this, and Colleen and the core team and all the men that are serving, Lord, all of these people that you have brought together to make this happen. Will you help us to do it in a way that honors and glorifies you, Father? More than anything, we want to know you more. So please, will you do that for us this weekend? And we pray all of these things in our Savior Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so before we worship, we have one more piece of business. I'm not going to make you sing happy birthday, but it is Jack's birthday today. And so what we're going to do is, let's see how loud you can do it, if you can really, you know, blow the doors off. But we want to say happy birthday, Jack. You ready? Happy birthday, Jack, on three. Okay, so I'm going to say three, and then you say it. (laughs) Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Jack. You are awesome. That was so good. (laughs) Jack. Well done. All right, so why don't you go ahead and stand? We are going to continue to worship God through song today. Sacrifice. 
Thank you, band. You all may be seated. It's good to see you. Glad that everybody could come this evening. My name is Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer. And I have two tasks tonight. Number one is going to be to announce our and welcome our speaker. But I want to explain just a little bit from the heart of our pastoral team. What is the purpose of Be Ready? Why the theme of Be Ready? And really, when, when, when we think about that, we want to understand that Conferences happen all the time. Information is given all the time. Right? We, can, we can gather stuff. We can read. We can absorb. But what do we do with that information? Right? Like we could have a conference on bibliology or we could have a conference on knowing more. But how are we going to put that information to use? And so we have in mind... Ephesians 4.11, for most of our ministries, right, that he gave the apostles and prophets and the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that, as we see the results, the building up of the body and the bringing the entire church along to be a mature institution that can represent Christ well in the world. So be ready means that the information that you get in a conference like this, we're attempting to equip you to be ready for whatever comes at you in life, to be ready to share the hope that is in you, to be, to be ready to, to understand the attacks that are going to come at you from the world. And what the world says truth is and what the world is going to say about Jesus. And very easily that could break you and very easily that could discourage you if you are not ready to defend and understand the truth. And so as we gather this evening and tomorrow for a topic like unmet expectations... Or if you saw the spine of your book, Unmet Expectations. It's such a perfect analogy, isn't it? That the book that was going to be printed and is perfect and it's just wonderful, has this great, but you know what it is? It's like you get the early copy, and now later on when Lisa's super famous and you get it signed, and now it's going to be worth a lot of money, right? Because it's, no, I'm just kidding. But it's this perfect analogy that we have this idea of the way things should go. And we set in our minds the way that things should be. And when it doesn't happen, we get angry. Right? And anger isn't a feeling. Anger is a negative moral judgment, deciding that something shouldn't be the way it is, and God is at fault, or other people are at fault, and so we hold it against them. So we don't want that, that to be our hard attitude. We want to be ready for whatever the Lord brings at us, including when our expectations are not met. 
And so we're excited that you're here. We're excited for this topic in particular. Hopefully, you'll find it immensely practical for yourselves. And for those in your family, we want you to share whatever you learn, whatever the Lord teaches you with everyone in your sphere of influence. Well, it's my joy to be able to welcome Lisa Hughes. And for those of you who are not familiar with her, you're going to be by the end of the weekend, and I'm excited for that. Not only Lisa, you're also going to be familiar with her husband, Dr. Jack Hughes, who will be with us preaching this weekend for Redeemer Bible Church. We're very excited about that. Uh, I had the privilege of spending four years in ministry with Jack and Lisa at Anchor Bible Church in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And it's just a wonderfully like-minded church of saints who love us and we love them. The more you can get to know them, the better. Go up and look them up on, on the website. Look up the Anchor Bible Church app. Just hours and hours and hours of sermons and wonderful uh, uh, resources for you. And Lisa also has a website called Scripture, pa- Scripture Paths, Scripture Pathways. Which one is it? ScripturePaths.com. And Lisa has dedicated her life to, uh, to, to creating resources for women in the church to study the word and to know Jesus better. And in, in reality, to be ready for whatever circumstances might hit you. And so when we were thinking of people that we wanted to come and speak at our conference, uh, we, those of us who know her well know that she would do that for us and serve us very, very well this weekend. So uh, it's my hope and my prayer that you get to know her, that you would pray for her and pray for Jack and their ministry, pray for Anchor Bible Church. Uh, And and in the meantime, um, fellowship together well around what you learn. Pay attention. Uh, Take this time captive. Take your thoughts captive and really listen and see what the Lord has for you this weekend. So we just want to say as as a pastoral team, leadership team, thank you for being here. And please help me welcome Lisa Hughes to the stage. Thanks, guys. Well, I am so happy to be here. We've been looking forward to uh, just this time and this weekend with you all. And um, it's just always wonderful when it finally arrives. And I finally get to travel and be here and be um, just to see what the Lord is going to do. And... So I've been looking forward to just meeting you all. (laughs) And um, I hope that I get a chance to visit with you a little bit more and uh, just we have some time together. Um, So introductions always make me really nervous. I have no idea who that person is that people say I am. Um, I'm just a mom. I'm a grandma. And um, we have uh, I, we have three kids. They're all grown. They're kind of all spread out. I don't have anybody. Um, our daughter and her family are the closest. And um, so our grandkids are 12 hours away, which is a very short drive when I get in the car because grandma's going to see the kiddos. And so... Um, I do that in one day just so I can get there before they go to bed. And so we have, um, I won't won't bother telling you about our kids. Grandkids are where it's all at. So um, (laughs) we have uh, our four-year-old Faye, and then we have almost two-year-old Seth, and then we have a a third baby on the way uh, that we're very excited about. And um, Faye has decided that it's going to be called Judy. And uh, her mommy and daddy have said, did you know that mommies and daddies get to name the babies? So I don't think they want to name the baby Judy for what I'm not sure. So I think it's actually really cute. So, But we have no idea if we're having, um, if there's a little girl or a little boy, but the Lord certainly knows. So um, let's see. I pretty much um, just... I'm at my church, just like you're all at your church, and and I take care of my hubby. I keep him fed and watered, you know, and <laughs> and he he works hard, and I keep him so he can keep going. And I mean, that's what we do, don't we? And and the rest of the time, I'm pretty much at my computer 
writing and typing. And, and um, when I'm not at my computer, I'm meeting with people and uh, teaching Bible study and, and meeting with people for discipleship. I mean, my life looks just like yours. And uh, so I do get this fun little thing, though, where I get to fly on a plane and come and meet friends. And uh, so I am very thankful. And uh, the whole topic of unmet expectations is one that I've been working on for longer than I thought I would, which is another unmet expectation. I figured I'd be done with it by now, and I'm not. And, uh, but I started working on this uh, topic a number of years ago simply because one of the pastors at our church at the time had said, I've been noticing this coming up in counseling, and I was wondering if you could teach on it, because I think it would head off some of the things we're dealing with in, in counseling. And so I just put together one session and then every, everything in life turned out to be about unmet expectations. And so I, I started adding session after session. And then I eventually just wrote a book on it. And, um, and then I've been writing more, more sessions since. And so I put together extra stuff for us for this because I couldn't bear the idea that I would just simply tell you what's in the book. Um, you can read the book, so I'm going to tell you other things, and um, and we are going to deal with some things tomorrow that are in the book, um, but the book isn't done because we have, really, we're not going to come to the end of things, um, areas in our lives where we have unmet expectations because God does use them for our good and his glory, and so Kyle did mention um, some an unmet expectation that I have dealt with recently. So my book came out super exciting. I've been working on it for a long time. Finally came out. Took took forever, you know. And so I was like, ah, oh, it's here. So um, I had a few extra copies, and they were sitting on the counter. I'm talking on the phone to my dad, and I'm we're just chatting about stuff, and and I'm looking at the book sitting there on the counter. And all of a sudden, I was like, that looks like that word is misspelled. And I didn't say anything to my dad because I thought, I, I'm, I'm not reading it right. I'm just going to get off the phone. And I didn't want to be like, <laughs> on the phone with my dad. And so I get off the phone, and it still says, unmet expectations. <laughs> so I took a picture of it. And the next day, I emailed my editor <laughs> because I, I thought, I, I want to wait and I need to make sure that my heart is right before I <laughs> email my editor. <laughs> and I said, look what I just found. <laughs> and, but we had uh, the best time. But during... <laughs> 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 While I was... Uh, working on this in those first moments, I mean, my heart just sank. I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> I am, my, my kids actually laugh because they said, Mom, you are the spelling Nazi. <laughs> and so then to have that happen, which is true. I mean, misspellings are kind of my thing. And so uh, to have it misspelled on the spine was just like, Lord. And then I just thought, I've written a book on unmet expectations. <laughs> I have to start applying this. <laughs> and so I did. And all I wanted to do was start crying, but it's like, no. And then I wanted to have a pity party, but it's like, no. And, and so I just started going through it. <laughs> and my heart was encouraged. So that by the next day when I did write my editor, I was able to rejoice because God had worked in me so that I could be glad. And now I'm actually kind of sad that we're going to fix it because I love the visual that this has. So you all do have the first edition. It is going to be getting fixed. And I don't think anybody's really going to be all that excited about it in years to come. But... I'm glad that you have it because, um, to me, it is the perfect example of, this is how I thought life was going to be. <laughs> and then, 
And then you've got unmet expectations. <laughs> Thankfully, the Lord was so merciful. This is spelled correctly on the front. <laughs> so we're here because we all know about unmet expectations. We've dealt with them on different, on different levels. And I do want you to be kind of be thinking about this. So we're going to, a little bit, we're going to kind of jump into the deep end. Um, I figure you can read the book. So you can start, you can go back and just wade into the whole topic of unmet expectations. But we, we don't have very much time together. And I would rather we jump in and we can begin dealing with things. Um, and then you can read the book and gain more um, from there. But I want you to consider about some of the things that you've dealt with in your life or maybe you're dealing with right now, the things that are unexpected or surprising. And sometimes those things aren't, you know, that's not a big deal. But sometimes they're discouraging. Um, Delays are huge, aren't they, when you have to wait and wait and wait for things. Um, and how are we responding, whether we're surprised, whether it's unexpected, whether we're discouraged, despairing, we're having to wait, um, what's our response? That's really why I wrote the book. How can we respond well even when life doesn't turn out the way we thought it would? And, you know, the answer is life is always not going to turn out the way we thought it would. But how can we learn then from the scriptures, how can we learn to respond well when we're surprised by the unexpected? Is it possible to respond in a God-glorifying way even when circumstances are less than we hoped? And then what do we do if we realize, if and when we realize, I'm responding sinfully right now. I am having a big old pity party. I am pouting. I've just slammed a cupboard door. I'm responding sinfully to this circumstance that God has lovingly placed in my life. What do we do then? How can we then have our, our second response be our godly response? Now, a momentary struggle to accept what God has placed in our lives is part of the process that God uses to lead us to faith to help us to trust him. I mean, I had to get my act together here with this, didn't I? And, uh, and so we want to take that time to accept and, and to learn to take these things to the Lord and to ask him to help us to respond well. Um, so we do have expectations, and expectations are natural. They're, they're part of the things that God actually makes us excited for. We look forward to coming to a women's conference, the second annual. I love second annual anything, because that means the first one went really well, and you want to do it again. And so the fact that you have second annual women's conference is huge, and I'm thrilled to be at the second annual one. Um, so we all have expectations about things, and, you know, we don't have a problem handling expectations when it's wonderful. It's like, yeah, so great. Um, and when things are better than we thought they would be, and we're so happy and so thankful, and we just rejoice, and our little cheeks are just, you know, tired of smiling, you know, because we're having such a great time. We're humbled by the Lord's kindness um, the problem is, is when we have expectations that aren't met and we are struggling in one degree or another. And we've all been at that place. I know that you have been um, in w one way or another where you have been overwhelmed when your expectations about something haven't been met. And so it's when we come to the crossroads then. This isn't how I thought it was going to be. So now what? How am I going to respond so that I can live the way I, I think the Bible says I should live, the way that I want to live, the way God would love, want me to live, how I can be a godly example to others? And when we come to the crossroads, we have to consider what am I going to do next? 
And there are times when I've been at these crossroads that I've wondered, why is it so hard for me to get on board with God's plan when things aren't proceeding the way that I thought they would? You know, don't you feel that way sometimes? Haven't you wondered that? Why is it so hard, Lord, for me to just get back in line with what you're doing? What is it that hinders me from experiencing joy and peace when circumstances are different than they thought they'd be? Sometimes we, we have a really hard time to be, uh, being joyful in those different circumstances. How can I give God glory when life turns out different than I thought it would? How can I respond with joy and trust even if my longings in this life are never realized? Can I truly respond with peace and trust even while my hopes for something different grow dim? Whenever we struggle with our expectations not being met the way we thought they should and then see the sinful fruit of those, um, our response crop up in our lives, then we know that we have some wrong thinking going on to some degree. And we aren't thinking correctly about the Lord or our circumstances or about other people. And sometimes we're not immediately aware of how we're really thinking. You know, we're not necessarily aware that we aren't thinking biblically. We're just kind of responding. We're going through life, and we haven't really clued in yet. (laughs) Uh, But sometimes others can see our response. They can tell that we're not thinking biblically. But maybe here's, here's a list of things that I use to te- where I can kind of gauge my thinking, um, my speech, to see if I'm thinking biblically. So, um, if, or if I'm not thinking biblically. The first one would be, I don't deserve this. If I say, I don't deserve this, or if I'm thinking, I don't deserve this, I know I'm not thinking biblically. Because the, the scriptures are clear what we really do deserve. Or I might think, God doesn't care what happens to me. Now, you might not ever say that out loud, but sometimes that is what's going on in our hearts. And if we think that, then we're not thinking biblically. We're not thinking accurately. Here's my favorite one. That's the last straw. Now, you might not say that, but we all have our little, like, I can't be expected to put up with this any longer. Because it's, and it's almost like we get to decide when the last straw is. Well, that's not, that is not going to give God glory. It certainly isn't biblical. It's not my fault. That's the other one. God knows, uh, doesn't know what is best. I've got the better plan. In fact, I've told you all about it, Lord. I've been praying about it, and I've told you exactly what needs to happen. (laughs) Don't we do that? Our prayer times are often instructing the Lord because we know what is best. Um, Or the last one of the other ones is it, it feels like God doesn't love me because if he did, he would have whatever. So we have these little things that happen in our hearts, and you might not ever say those things out loud, but they're still there, aren't they? And those things become the, the seeds of a wrong response to the unmet expectations, the different circumstances that happen in our lives. English pastor uh, Robert C. Chapman said this, we may be dealing honestly with sin, that is, that is seen outwardly. We may be looking at it and seeing this is a, a sin area in my life. Um, he says, we may, not, we may be dealing honestly with sin that is seen outwardly and yet not skillfully and effectually because of not striking at the deep roots of evil within. And Chapman put his finger on one of the problems we encounter when we're trying to overcome sin and our wrong responses. We may recognize that we're responding sinfully, but we're not necessarily dealing with it effectively because we're not getting to the root. We're maybe dealing with the outward parts, but we're not getting to what's going on in the core of our hearts. And so um, what we want to do during our time together in our sessions tonight and in tomorrow is 
to get to the root of the problem that's going on in our hearts so we can deal effectively with our wrong responses or even be proactive in our responses to unmet expectations when life just is different. There's no guarantee that our lives are going to continue in this trajectory. Uh, but God is with us every step in every part of it. And so we can trust him in it. So let me open up in prayer now. That was just the opener to the weekend. Uh, so, and then uh, we'll get into uh, this session. Father, we do thank you for this time. And I, I thank you for these ladies. I have no idea what they've been expecting. But I know what I've been expecting from you, Lord, and that is help. I've been expecting um, your word to work deep and mightily in, um, in me and in the hearts of the ladies, that it would be a lasting work, Lord. I know that uh, I can trust you with these things because you have promised um, to use your word mightily. Lord, we know that you are here um, because you are with every believer, and we can um, give you this time. I ask for your help, Lord, um, as I teach. I ask for your help for the ladies as they listen, and that you would be uh, the joy of their hearts. For any here who don't know you, Lord, I ask that you would quicken their hearts, um, and that today would be the day of salvation. We thank you for this time, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we, I told you we have three kids. So our daughter Leah is the oldest. Then we have Nate, who's the middle, and then Mark. And uh, so our son Nate is um, a, just a great photographer. He's super artistic, and he, he's one of those people that doesn't even have to work really hard and does a great job. And um, he had this really nice digital camera. And uh, he would take pictures, and uh, you know, it was just really fun. And I was kind of interested in learning how to do that. And because our son um, was working a lot, then he said, Mom, you know, why don't you just take my camera, and I'll teach you how to use it, and then you can explore your photography side. And, um, and so he, he generously let me use his camera. And uh, we had this glorious time. He would call and we'd talk f-stops and all kinds of, you know, photography lingo. And it was super fun. And I, I loved it. And I, I loved that camera. And I um, really enjoyed just taking pictures of uh, especially people. And, uh, and so I was you know, working on all my little photography skills, and, um, and then one day, my son, Nate, called me and asked for his camera back, <laughs> and, which is right, it was his camera, only my heart struggled. I didn't want to give the camera back to my son. <laughs> it was so naughty. It was just like... <laughs> And I had this huge case of coveting my son's camera. And, um, I, and I realized I was struggling because I really didn't think he was going to ask for it back. I thought he was going to call me and say, Mom, you know, I haven't been using the camera, and I know you have, and so I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> So when he called and asked for his camera back, I had this huge, like, well, it's, I, uh, it's mine, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. And what I learned is that my expectations can really stir up sin, like ugly sin. I was so surprised at the stuff that came up out of my heart, just from my son, my son, who I love that he, when he asked for his camera back, I wasn't thankful for all the time that he'd let me have it. I wasn't thankful that he had allowed me or taught me how to use it. And really, if, in the, if you, I label it correctly, I was mad 
that he wanted it back because I wanted to keep it. It was so terrible. And I didn't tell him about my little struggle. In fact, it it took me a long time to tell him about my struggle because I was so ashamed. I finally did confess <laughs> that um, just about the struggle, and we had a good laugh about it, and uh, just um, as the Lord worked on it. But by the time I did mail mailed him the cu- the camera back, I my heart was properly thankful, and I had repented of every one of those sins. But it really surprised me. I was surprised of what was stirred up in my heart. And sometimes when we have things that come upon us unexpectedly, they stir up some really ugly sins in our hearts that we just thought, how did this get here? I have not sinned like this in forever or ever. And yet here it was. Um, I was completely surprised by my expectations. I was surprised by the sin that came up in my heart because of my expectations. And sometimes that our expectations can surprise us and lead us to respond in ways or even do things that we would never consider doing under normal circumstances. And so for our session tonight, we're going to look at someone who had that happen to him, and that is King Hezekiah. And we're going to be looking in Second Chronicles 32. So you can uh, look there. We're, we're going to be a little bit all over, but we are going to be looking in 32, and you can have that as your anchor. King Hezekiah had a similar situation in which he was completely surprised by the expectations in his heart. And when we meet Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 32, he's in the middle of an incredibly stressful situation. The Assyrians were on their way to lay siege uh, to Jerusalem, and though Hezekiah was placing his faith in the Lord uh, to deliver him and to deliver the nation, it was still really difficult. It was a really hard situation. Hezekiah was godly. He was humble. He was taking everything to the Lord and asking God to help him and deliver them from the Assyrians as they were marching toward Jerusalem. And if you've ever gone through a a protracted time of trial, just a long trial, then you know how hard it can be to remain firmly steadfast in turning to the Lord when you are afraid. It's mentally and even physically taxing on us to keep clinging tightly to the Lord. And if if you've gone through that, you know what I mean, where it's just hard and you have to keep bringing your mind back to what is true and that you can get worn out. Well, that is certainly the situation that happened with Hezekiah. And times like that can take their toll on us and leave us feeling a little wrung out, a little emotional and worn out. And the intense stretching in the trial can certainly stir up some long hidden expectations about what life should look like. And sometimes it's, we should be through this. I should, we should be done with this. And especially, we deal with expectations of, Lord, I've been doing everything that you've asked me to, and now this? And that's what was happening with Hezekiah in this situation that we're going to be looking at. After the threat of invasion had passed, and because God had miraculously delivered Hezekiah and the nation. Uh, Then we read this in 2 Chronicles 32, starting in verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. However, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. The scriptures tell us that Hezekiah loved the Lord. He sought to do what is right. He tried to live uprightly before the Lord and be a good and godly example in front of the watching nation. And yet in this instance, something had so rattled his cage that he didn't respond well to the Lord's graciousness. 
the Lord was using Hezekiah to, to turn the nation back to following the Lord. He was, he was instructing them and teaching them in the ways of the Lord. And yet, it appears that Hezekiah may have had some expectations of how the Lord would deal with him personally because he had been so faithful in all that he had been doing. And Hezekiah is a great example of how any one of us can grow stubbornly ungrateful when the unexpected happens. And that brings us to our first point, which is when we're disoriented by the unexpected. And we're going to look at verse 24. And verse 24 says, of 2 Chronicles 32, In those days Hezekiah became mortally ill. Now the companion passage to 2 Chronicles 32 is found in Isaiah 38. And in verse 1 of Isaiah 31, it says this, In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. So after living upon the mountain of faith, Hezekiah is now plunged into the valley. He got sick, and he's told, You're going to die. Now, what is amazing about this is the Lord was so gracious to tell Hezekiah ahead of time. It wasn't like it just happened. He told him, set your things in order. You've got time, but you're going to die from this illness. But the knowledge of that threw Hezekiah into a tailspin. Most in Israel believed if you suffered some great long-term sickness or calamity, it was a sign of God's displeasure with you for some reason. It's the exact same mindset that we see of Job and what he was dealing with with his friends. All of his friends were like, you must ascend in some way because otherwise this wouldn't be happening to you. And so it was the same idea. Hezekiah was probably around age 39 when he was sick. So he is still a young man. Um, and most people at this, in Israel at this time thought, you know, if you get sick and you die or you get this big sickness or have these kinds of calamities happening on you when you're young, that is a sign of God's displeasure. And uh, so for Hezekiah to come down with a mortal illness like this, at uh, this young age, it to him, it felt like the Lord was declaring in neon for everyone to see, this man has sinned and I am punishing him. That's what it felt like to Hezekiah. Hezekiah had been faithful to the Lord. He tried to honor the Lord and all that he had done. Um, Hezekiah, in, or in 2 Kings 18, verses 5 and 6, it says of Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Hezekiah believed that the Lord would reward him for his faithfulness, not punish him with sickness and death. And Isaiah 38 verses 2 and 3 says that when Hezekiah found out about the intended nature of his sickness, you're going to die, then it says that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. He's in despair. And he said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech you how I've walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Hezekiah was devastated by God's plan for his life. So when we read in Isaiah 38 that he turned his face to the wall and talked to the Lord and pleaded, just, Lord, I've been faithful and then he wept bitterly, we can kind of understand because that's how we live. We, we're, we're, we're trying to do what's right, Lord. We're trying to follow you. I've been doing all the stuff that you tell me. How come then this is happening in my life? And for some of you, that's where you're living right now. You're there, and you know what I'm talking about. That, that feeling of, I don't understand because I thought if I did A, B, and C, then surely D would happen. Only now you're on J. (laughs) And that's where Hezekiah was. He was on Z, actually. 
Hezekiah did not expect this scenario for his life. This is not how he thought his life was going to go. He'd been trying to do what's right. He'd been trying to seek the Lord. And then he's, God says, no, you're going to die young. And Hezekiah's like, no, I am not. I am not going to die young, Lord. That is not how I want to go. And he wasn't having it. And he was bitter. He was bitter against God's plan for his life. He was resisting what God intended, God's good for his life. When the trial came upon him, the expectations of his heart were revealed. And it happens to all of us. God uses the trials. He uses the expectations, the the unexpected, the surprises, the I never thought this was how it was going to be kinds of things in our lives. And they bring our expectations to the surface because God intends to refine and sanctify us. Hezekiah probably didn't even know about those expectations that he had that that God would bless him for his faithfulness. So when God told him that he would soon die, Hezekiah pouted. He grew stubborn and resistant to God's plan. He grew bitter toward the Lord and pridefully judged God's dealings with him. And yet, even in the unfolding of God's plan for Hezekiah's life, the Lord continued to show mercy and kindness to Hezekiah, and he answered Hezekiah's prayer by delaying his death. Second Chronicles 32, 24 goes on to say, Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. And Isaiah 38, verses 4 through 8, explains what that sign is. Um, it says, uh, let's see. The Lord said to Hezekiah, Hezekiah, um, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, and I'm going to add 15 years to your life. So he got a reprieve, 15 more years. This shall be a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do what he has spoken. Behold, I will cause the shadow on the stairway, which has gone down with the sun, I will cause it to go back 10 steps. So he, the Lord even gave him a sign. I, I for sure, you are going to live 15 more years because I have given you this sign that, it will, that I will keep my word. And that brings us to our second point, which is dismaying displays of sin, in which we see in verse 25 of Second Chronicles 32. Verse 25 says, But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. When you read that, you just want to go, oh, no, what? The Lord was so gracious to you, Hezekiah. Fifteen years he gave you. But Hezekiah gave no return to the Lord for the benefit that he had received. The NIV puts it this way. But Hezekiah did not respond to the kindness shown him. I mean, we've seen, we've seen little ones that way. Probably never us, <laughs> except for you all know it was me because that was how I was with my son. But none of you ladies. It only happens to ladies in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Where we don't respond to the kindness of the Lord. We get a little stiff. A little, well, it's about time. Hezekiah wasn't grateful for the Lord's kindness to him. Now, obviously, this is not okay with the Lord. And we read in verse 25 that the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Hezekiah's unmet expectations caused him to stumble and respond sinfully to the Lord. But we have to ask ourselves, why? Why wasn't Hezekiah grateful for the Lord's mercies. Why didn't he give a return for the benefits that he'd received? And verse 25 tells us, because his heart was proud. And this is so wonderful that the Lord put that little bit in there. That's that little phrase. Because the scriptures always bring to light our sins. God uses his word to help us pinpoint the sin. And for, he, for Hezekiah, God brought to light The reason that Hezekiah was ungrateful, his pride. That happens to us too, doesn't it? Why aren't we thankful for what God is doing in our lives? Pride. 
because I think I deserve better, something more, something different. We come up with all these things, don't we? And Hezekiah's ungrateful heart was filled with pride. Pride creates a stumbling block in our hearts, which leads to ingratitude. When we are proud in heart, we think that God should do something different for us, or somehow maybe he owes us, or that we deserve something better. And pride does make us stiff inside. It makes us stubborn, uh, so that when even when the Lord does show us mercy, like the Lord did to Hezekiah, we receive it with an attitude that's like, um, it's about time, or um, I've been waiting, you know, all those kinds of th- responses where instead of being thankful and humble, this is a fearful place for us to be, and we certainly don't want to stay there. Henry Ward Beecher said, Pride slays thanksgiving, but a humble mind is the soil of which thanks naturally grow. A proud man is seldom a grateful man, for he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. Now, I know you all know about pride. You probably memorized some verses on it, or at least you've, you've had your children memorize verses on it. Proverbs 16, 5 tells us everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not go unpunished. James 4, 6 says that God is opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. And we see that when there's pride, there's consequences. As a result, God is faithful to deal with the sin of pride in our lives. Pride fosters a sense of entitlement, and it cripples gratitude. Our ingratitude and our lack of thankfulness and our soul and hearts reveal pride that is there. And pride leads us to think that we deserve something different than we're receiving. J.C. Ryle said this, This, after all, is the true secret of a thankful spirit. It is the man who daily feels his debt to grace and daily remembers that in reality he deserves nothing but hell. This is the man who will be daily blessing and praising God. Thankfulness is a flower that will never bloom well except when rooted in deep humility. When we understand how deeply indebted we are to the Lord for his many mercies and care for us, we don't have a problem being grateful. A humble heart is grateful. You know, we all know about Nebuchadnezzar and his prideful heart and how he ended up eating grass because of the pride of his heart. That was the consequences for the pride of his heart. But Nebuchadnezzar said this after his, his trial, after the consequences of his sin. He said this in Daniel 4.37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, And honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true, his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. It's far wiser for us to listen to Peter's counsel in 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7, when he tells us how to deal with our pride. He says, likewise, you younger men, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, Why? Because God is opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God knows how to fix our hearts. He created us. So he knows what our hearts need, and he knows the areas in our hearts that need to be dealt with. And one of the ways that God uses um, our circumstances in our lives to rid us of pride is to humble us by making us depend on him. It's what happened with Hezekiah. It's what happened in the book of Deuteronomy to the nation of Israel. And God says in Deuteronomy 8, uh, verse 16, that it says that God did all of these things where they were without water, they were without food, they needed the Lord to lead them, to cover them with a cloud, to warm them up at night, 
so that he could humble them, that he might test them to do good for them in the end. And that's exactly what the Lord is doing for us. He humbles us. Uh, he tests us to see how we're going to respond so that he will do good for us in the end. We forget that the Lord allows unmet expectations, difficulties, trials, delays, misspelled book bindings, um, to do good for us in the end. If only we would remember that, right? If only we would remember that and rejoice. J.C. Ryle said, Murmurings and complainings and discontent abound on every side of us. Few indeed are to be found who are not continually hiding their mercies under a bushel and setting their needs and trials on a hill. And all that, that Ryle is saying there is we're more prone to make much of our trials. That's what we put on display instead of all the ways that the Lord has shown mercy. We're quicker to talk about our trials than we are that, to talk about the Lord's mercies to us. Our focus determines our gratefulness, which is why the admonition in Psalm 103.2 is so crucial for us to put into practice. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget none of his benefits. Forget none of his benefits. Psalm 103.2 shows us that we have a, a choice to make. What are we going to focus on the next time we're struggling in our response to the unmet expectations in our lives? Are we going to focus on what's missing so that we're making much of all the stuff that the trials and the things that and the if onlys? Or are we going to focus on the mercies that God is tucking away in our lives? It always comes down to choosing how we're going to respond in our, th in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our lives. And yet knowing that you need to be thankful doesn't make it any easier. I mean, I can say, you just need to be thankful, and you can all say, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't make it any easier. I mean, it's still hard. There are times when it's really hard to be thankful for things, um, especially when the deeper the, the issue in your heart. And sometimes it, you think, this is so dorky. This is just a little thing. And it's super hard to get over. And then sometimes it's the, deeper, the deepest thing in your life. It's, it's one of those things that you, you find just desperately hard to get over. But here are three things that I have put in place in my life um, and they're not life-changing or earth-shattering. They are life-changing. They're not earth-shaking. Um, and the first is just beg God to make you thankful. Psalm 30, verse 2 says, O oh Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. We just have to beg the Lord to make us thankful. There are times when we're not. R.C. Chapman said this, The more bitter the cup of discipline, the more reason for our thankfulness. If we be not thankful, let us give God no rest, nor ourselves, until he make us so. Have you ever spent the night just begging God to make you thankful? Sometimes we need to. Sometimes it's better for you to stay up begging the Lord to make you thankful than to get the rest. Number two, tell yourself the truth about your situation. Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6, David was surveying the circumstances of his lives, and he uses the language of the inheritance laws, um, and he's looking at his life, which is full of strife and trial and difficulty. And he says this in Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. Lord, you support my lot. The lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. David said that in the midst of persecution and trial and difficulty. And he is looking at the circumstances where the Lord had placed him. And David told himself the truth. Lord, the lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. We have to tell ourselves the truths about our situation. If God has given it, they are pleasant places for us. Wherever you're living, are you living here? 
pleasant places. Are you living here? Pleasant places. But are we telling ourselves the truth about it? We have to go back to what we know is true. My heritage, Lord, this, this place that you have me, it's beautiful. Thank you for where you've placed me. Beg God to make you thankful. Tell yourself the truth about this situation. Number three, give thanks by faith. Uh, George Matheson was a preacher in Scotland in the 1800s, and he grew nearly blind in his early 20s. And he's best known for the, uh, writing the hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. But he once said this, My God, I have never thanked thee for my thorn. I have thanked thee a thousand times for my roses, but never once for my thorn. I have been looking forward to a world where I shall get con compensation for my cross as itself a glory. Teach me the glory of my cross. Teach me the value of my thorn. Show me that I have climbed to thee by the path of pain. Show me that my tears have made my rainbow. We know from Hebrews 11.6 that any time we practice faith, whenever we live by faith, it pleases God. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you are struggling to be grateful, to have a, a thankful spirit in your circumstances, then do it by faith. Step out. Lord, I'm thanking you ahead of time. Does it, I'm not thankful yet. But I want to be, and I want to trust you because I believe that is what is good and honoring to you. R.C. Chapman said this, To quarrel with the instruments of, God, uh, instruments of God used for our correction is to quarrel with God himself. It is, in fact, to say to him, I do not approve of your governing, and I could order matters better if they were left to me. What is this but to aim at casting down God from his throne and setting ourselves upon it? But we do that, don't we? This isn't the best way, Lord. I've got a better plan. Why am I here? I don't like this. I mean, we do all of those things, don't we? And when we do that, we're saying, I've got, I can take place. I can be on the throne, Lord. I can be the one ruling and reigning perfectly. So from verse 24, we, we've seen how easy it is to become disoriented by the unexpected. In verse 25, we looked at how the unexpected events in our lives can tempt us to sin by stubbornly and pridefully resisting God's good plan. And now we come to our third and final point, which is where we are disarmed by grace. And it says in verse 26, However, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. And what we see here is that God always gets us where he wants us. He's going to work on our hearts. He's going to continue. And what does God desire from us? Not a proud heart, but a humble one. And so he's going to get us to where our hearts can respond humbly with repentance, asking the Lord to help us. The trial and the lessons Hezekiah learned taught him to submit to and humble himself under God's good, wise, and sovereign plan for his life. Jeremiah tells us in Lamentations 3, 25 through 28, that the Lord uses the disappointment disappointments, trials, and delays to get us where he wants us. Jeremiah said, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and be silent since the Lord has laid it on him. And Jesus affirms the gentling influence of the yoke. You know, it's good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. And then Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And when you do that, what does Jesus tell us? You will find rest for your souls. Jeremiah goes on to even tell us more in Lamentations 3 and verses 37 through 41 
about the lessons of the yoke when he says, Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? And what we see here is that if we're going to wear the yoke that the Lord has placed upon us, then we need to think rightly about the Lord. And that's what Jeremiah is doing there in Lamentations 3, 37 and 38. Verse 39, he says, Why should, we li should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? He's telling himself the truth, isn't he? Removing that sense of entitlement that would make him not wear that yoke well. And then Jeremiah says in verse 40, let us examine and probe our ways. Let us return to the Lord. We lift up our heart and hands toward the God of heaven. When we are properly humbled under the yoke of unmet expectations, when we're properly humbled by our circumstances, then we're going to examine and probe our hearts. We're going to look there. We're going to repent and lift up our hearts and our hands towards the Lord. Thomas Brooks had this to say about the blessings of the yoke. He said, the bull, unaccustomed to the yoke, is impatient. After the bull is accustomed to labor, he willingly puts his neck under the yoke. God works out by degrees a sweet, obedient frame. At length, God brings his children to subscribe what God wills, when God wills, how God wills, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The business of unmet expectations is the training ground for submission and humility in God's perfect wisdom and sovereign plans for our lives. Hezekiah loved God, and he desired to walk in God's paths, but he also had to learn that God is God. And God's ways are different. God's going to do things in different ways. And so he had to bring his ideas and bring them under and in line with what God was doing. Because God is perfect in his plans, in his ways, and they, they're going to look different than what we think. God will often bring about circumstances we would never choose for our lives. How many of you are living there? And yet, in their unfolding, we learn the lessons that we need to learn so we can give God glory. In the book of 1 Samuel, when uh, Samuel was a young boy and he was living in the house of the Lord as helper to the priest Eli, the Lord revealed to Samuel that a time of judgment was soon going to be coming upon Eli because Eli and his sons had been unfaithful in how they were serving the Lord. And upon hearing what God had decreed for them, that judgment was coming, Eli responded with these words in 1 Samuel 3.18. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Eli was not faithful to the Lord. He had a lot of faults. But in this one case, there is this wonderful response of how Eli responded. You know, this, this judgment that, that Samuel told Eli about, I mean, it must have been terrifying for him. And yet, it wasn't anything that he wanted. It wasn't going to be like, oh, great. It wasn't that at all. But he submitted. He bowed his heart low before the wisdom and sovereignty and goodness of God. And so we have to ask ourselves, what if we responded like that? What if 1 Samuel 3.18 was my response to every circumstance in my life when it's just not going that well? It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Consider all the implications that are contained in the, that last sentence. We know who's at work. It's the Lord. We know what kind of God he is. He let him do what seems good to him. He, he's going to do what's good. We know he judges and acts with perfect wisdom. He does what seems best. He's going to do that. We know our place before him, whatever he decrees for us, and so we need to come under that. That's the language of all true heart worship, isn't it? And that's the faith-filled response that God longs to hear from every one of his children. 
our lives bring him glory when we learn to say, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. No matter how long it takes, no matter if my circumstances remain the same, no matter how difficult my situation is, if God has given it to me, it's good. And in that moment, all that remains for us is to bow in humble worship before the Lord because God is good. John Newton said, It is indeed natural to us to wish and to plan, and it is merciful in the Lord to disappoint our plans and to cross our wishes. For we cannot be safe, much less happy, but in proportion as we are weaned from our own wills and made simply desirous of being directed by his guidance. See, that's what unmet expectations do for us. As the Lord continues to change things up and life is different than we thought it was it was going to be, then we learn to wean ourselves off of our plans and to just say, Lord, you do what is best. Your ways are always best. I learned it last year. I learned it yesterday. I learned it 10 years ago. I mean, we learned it, right? We learned it, and today I need to learn it again. Hezekiah learned the lessons of unmet expectations. Listen to what he, his own testimony about it. In Isaiah 38, verse 17, he said this, Lo, for my own welfare, I had great bitterness. For my own good, God brought this bitter thing in my life. But he said, it is you, God, who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Hezekiah learned the lessons. And that's what the Lord is doing for us, too, through the, all those different circumstances that we find ourselves in. Hezekiah, when he started out, he gave no return to the Lord for the benefit that he had received from him. But as the Lord continued to work in his life, he humbled his pride, he humbled himself. He's, he got rid of his pride. And then he saw, as he looked back on it, Lord, for the great bitterness that you brought in my life, it was for my welfare. It was for my good. So what I want to do is just close in prayer, but I'm going to read um, a poem from Fanny Crosby. It's not as well known as some of her other hymns, but I would like to read it, and you can just listen and pray through that, and then I'm going to close us in prayer. God does not give me all I ask, nor answer as I pray, but oh, my cup is brimming o'er with blessings day by day. How often the joy I thought withheld delights my longing eyes. And so I thank him from my heart for what his love denies. Sometimes I miss a treasured link in friendship's hallowed chain, and yet his smile is my reward for every throb of pain. I look beyond where purer joys delight my longing eyes. And so I thank him from my heart for what his love denies. How tenderly he leadeth me when earthly hopes are dim, and when I falter by the way, he bids me lean on him. He lifts my soul above the clouds where friendship never dies, and so I thank him from my heart for what his love denies. And Lord, we come before you. Right now, in the quietness of our hearts, Lord, help us to thank you for what your love has denied us. Lord, we want to thank you for what you and your wisdom and love have given us that we really didn't want.
Lord, we thank you by faith. Lord, we ask that you would do a mighty work in us, help us to be grateful, to be humble, to submit to the circumstances in our lives that we are finding it difficult. And if that's not um, us today, may you use this to prepare our hearts for tomorrow. Lord, help us to give you glory in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. When God put it on the hearts of some of the women here at Redeemer to begin a women's ministry um, two-ish years ago, I put on Facebook a question and I asked, what are, would you be looking for in a women's ministry? And over and over and over again, uh, women answered two words, no fluff. That was no fluff. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for your faithfulness to the word. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay, hold on, because I'm going to blaze through some things very quickly. In your program, if you have a program, if you don't have a program, there are several in the back of the room. But if you have one, if you look on the notes pages, in the very bottom corner... Way down there is a QR code. Raise your hand if you know what a QR code is and how to use it. Keep them up. Keep them up. Okay. If you do not have your hand up and you are, keep them up, and you're next to a lady who has her hand up, talk to her. The reason why is because we are going to be having a Q&A session tomorrow uh, at the end of our time together, and that's how you can submit your questions to Lisa. Now, they're anonymous, so either you can show your friend next to you how to do it, or you can just type in or have her type in your, her question on your phone, and nobody will think it was your question. It's all anonymous, okay? So that's the QR code. We'll be reminding you about that. Uh, let's see. What else do we need to talk about? Okay. We're heading into our first break. We're a little late. That's not because of Lisa. That's because of the rest of us who like to chitty chat up here. So um, we do have, I know you were thinking this, where's the dessert? <laughs> May I introduce you to the dessert, which is a, wait for it, charcuterie board. I did have to look that up on YouTube to hear it. Charcuterie board. It is not charcuterie. It's charcuterie. Okay. There is a lovely display over at the worship center. And then lastly, there are vendor tables out in the breezeway, as we call it. There is Trinity Soap. Coronado Coffee and Righteous Wretch, and they're all owned or co-owned by um, folks who come to our church. And then also the Redeemer Bookstore has um, books available, including Lisa's first book. Okay, I think that is it, except, let me see. So we're heading out at 736. So you have 15 minutes at 751. <laughs> We need you back here. So we're a little off schedule, like I said, but at 7.51, if you can be back here, that'll be great. We'll see you then. Wow. Wasn't that a beautiful charcuterie board-ish type? For those of you that got to see it and those of you that actually got to have some. That might have... I have no idea, but I hope so. No, I didn't. I was in here. I didn't. No, um, I hope that you, most of you, were able to enjoy some of that. Um, if you get a hankering, uh, feel free, if you need to, to go get more or to get some, uh, if you haven't had any. But that was an unmet expectation for some of you and for some of us. And so we will not have a pity party, right, Lisa? We will rejoice and be thankful in the circle that he has given us. I am listening, and I am obeying 
the Lord in my lack of dessert. Okay, uh, let's see. I think that's it. So honestly, um, I just am here to say hello and to say hello to my mom and my friend Shannon who are waving at me. I knew it was going to happen at some point. Um, but let's get going and let's invite our speaker, Lisa, back up to teach us. All right, well, we're going to keep diving into the deep end here um, in this session. And more fun to come uh, for this, for our time. And we're just going to let everybody else kind of dribble on in. <laughs> uh, that, everything looks fabulous, wasn't it beautiful? Even if you just walked past the line. <laughs> uh, let's see. And my notes just disappeared. Hold on just a sec. There, it's back. Okay. <laughs> it's the tech part of things. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started and, uh, on this. So one of my favorite memes from uh, 2020 was the one that said, that moment when you realize the conspiracy theory nuts were right. I love that one. Um, that was, uh, we, I had this uh, lady that I was acquainted with, and um, when 2020 started, she was, she, all the conspiracy theories, she was letting us all know all about them. And then by the end of 2020, I was saying, she was right? She was right. That's so crazy. <laughs> Um, it was 2020 was the year that the conspiracy theorists and the the doomsday preppers were vindicated <laughs> for the first time. It was so exciting for them. <laughs> Prior to the last couple of years, if you had talked to anybody who was a prepper, then um, you probably thought they were a little bit off kilter. Like, what? Why are you doing this? But now we all know how important it is to prep. We all, and nobody leaves toilet paper anymore. <laughs> I don't know about you, but did you all have the cream cheese thing? Where we couldn't find cream cheese at Thanksgiving. Did, were you all low on cream cheese out here? And there, every once in a while, there's just this huge run on, on like cream for your coffee. You cannot find it anywhere. We, we do this big circuit looking for cream. <laughs> now we never go past the dairy aisle without buying cream. <laughs> and well, as their name um, implies, preppers prepare and plan for possible natural disasters, the collapse of society, emergencies, wars, whatever. Pre preppers focus on gathering and storing supplies and learning survival skills if the norms of everyday life are interrupted, like when there is a loss of power, electricity, water, food, basic supplies. So you know, we, we see that, and we've kind of experienced that to a certain extent. Um, but even more important than preparing our pantries for the unexpected is the need to prepare our hearts for whatever comes up next. And as we undergo uncertainties, pressures, trials, we need to be spiritual preppers. We need to assess and see where our spiritual pantry may be bare or running low, 
of the essential truths that we need to not only survive in God's sovereignly ordained events, but to thrive in them. God never intended us just to survive. He wants us to thrive. Learning to accept the unexpected begins with preparation. And in this session, we'll see why we need to prepare our souls with the truths from God's word so that when the unexpected comes, we won't be derailed. And in this session, we're going to spend time looking at the difference between Job's response and his wife's and why there was a difference in their responses. And then we're going to discover how we need to think so that we can weather the storms that God lovingly brings our way. So let's just um, pray again, um, asking the Lord's help. Father, we come before you. Prepare our hearts um, by your spirit. We know that you have lovingly prepared your word. You have given it to us, Lord. We, we ask that you would do a deep work in us. Help us to hear what is what you want for us to know. And Lord, we ask that you would also give us the courage to apply the truths that we learn here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in the book of Job as we look at, um, at this topic of preparing our hearts for the unexpected. And in Job chapter 1, I think most people have heard of Job. Um, most people know about Job and his wife and how they went through all kinds of calamities. And um, they, uh, they were successful. They had the, the kids. They had standing in society. They had wealth. They were financially secure. They'd had a long marriage. Um, they, they had it all. And they were doing well. They were happy. Life was good and easy for them. And then, um, then Satan said, well, he, God, you... Um, You've blessed Job so much that, of course, he's going to serve you. And so God said, okay, well, then why don't you um, test him? You can take away all the, everything except don't touch him. And uh, so that is exactly what Satan did. He brought calamity after calamity upon Job and so that they lost everything, Job and his wife. They lost uh, their, their children all of them. They, they lost their home. They lost their riches. They lost everything. Um, their standing in society, their reputations, everything they lost. And um, then, um, then Satan came before the Lord again and said, well, Job still hasn't um, turned his back on you, but it's because he's still healthy. And so then um, he was allowed to be touched and Job was then stricken with pain and suffering in his body. And we find Job and his wife in this situation of sorrow and loss and destruction in their lives when we look at them in Job chapter 2 in verse 9. And, um, and so we're going to look at verse 9 and gain some insight into the workings of Job's wife's heart. Now, what's interesting about Job's wife is verse 9 is the only time her words are recorded. And she says in verse 9, do you still hold fast your integrity, curse God, and die? Now, how would you like that to be the only thing that anybody ever hears of you? I mean, ladies, we need to be careful with our words. It would be so terrible, especially to have it written in the scriptures that live forever. <laughs> oh, they probably had lots of conversations. I'm sure they were talking, but this is the only thing that the Lord saw fit to keep here in the scriptures because her words are such a contrast to her husband's. And they provide for us an example of what happens when we don't prepare our hearts. She, just like her husband, 
had endured the loss of their wealth, their social standing in society, the devastation of losing all of her children. And now she's looking at her husband. He's this unrecognizable mess of sores and boils. She's grief-stricken. She's miserable. And she, she's bitter. She's angry. She's fearful. And yet it's still shocking to read verse 9. I mean, we can understand all of those things after just thinking about what it would be like to suffer that much loss. But when she says, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. It's like, oh, isn't it terrible? I mean, it's just so shocking that she would say that. How could she get to that place? How could she say something that wicked? It's wicked that what she said. And what does it really say about her and her expectations and what she believed about God? And that brings us to our first point that we're going to look at, when your expectations lead to foolishness. We have to ask ourselves, what could possibly have led to this woman. We don't know what she was like prior to this. She might have been really miserable to live with beforehand. (laughs) But I don't think so. I bet she was really sweet. I bet she was just like all of you. Really wonderful. But in that as she suffered loss after loss after loss, her the expectations of her heart came to the surface and her sin was put on display. And so we have to ask ourselves, what could have led to her making such a terrible comment? And we might excuse um, her, her words and, and say, yeah, you know, she just lost all of her children. Don't, you can't judge her for that. Um, she lost her home, her financial security, her position in society, her husband's sick. She's just venting. She didn't really mean it. We all feel all those same things. People say all kinds of things when they're upset. And it's true. We do, don't we? We say all kinds of wicked things when we're upset when we're venting. But does excusing it make it okay? Not to God, it doesn't. Job suffered all those same things and more, but he didn't make a wicked statement like that. So what's the difference between the two? What what made the difference between Job's wife's response and Job himself? You know, she said, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. And when we we look there, we can kind of infer some things about what she thought. She expected God's reward for living his way. She equated ease, comfort, and a lack of trials to God's blessing. She believed that if God didn't hold up his end of the bargain, then it was okay to turn away from him. She believed that long-term trials excused her from living with faith, honor, and integrity. And she decided when enough was enough. And so by chapter 2, verse 9, there it was. We don't know for sure, but it's possible she expected life to continue in the same easy patterns that she'd enjoyed up to this point. It's possible that she'd expected maybe a trial or two in their life but not a tsunami. She, as possible, she expected her husband to be as angry as she was, and he wasn't, which made her mad. (laughs) It's possible she expected God to treat her differently. It's okay for my hubby, not okay for me. It's possible she expected his protection from the trials. It's possible she expected trials for others, but not for herself and Job, because they had done everything right. They had lived God's way, so they deserved God's blessing. It's possible she expected God's blessing to mean 
a lack of difficulty. Yet just because she had these expectations, and I think we can listen to some of those and kind of hear some of the things that maybe we felt sometimes. Just because we have those expectations, that doesn't mean we have to stay with those expectations. Just because we think something initially doesn't mean we have to keep living that way. Just because we say something and maybe respond sinfully, that doesn't mean our second response needs to be sinful. God has given us a way out. He helps us so that we can respond differently than maybe our initial reaction might be. Job may have thought similarly in the beginning, but his response was far different than his wife's. And one of the things that we learn when we experience trials and difficulties and delays, all the unexpected in life, is that we gain insight into our hearts and what we've really been hoping in. As soon as that sin comes up in our hearts, we see, this is what I... I've been looking for this to be the answer to my, to my desires, to, to making me feel happy, to making me feel whole, to making me feel satisfied, to making me more godly even. We all do it, and that's why unmet expectations are part of the sanctification process that God uses to make us more like him. Job and his wife teach us the difference between clinging to our expectations or submitting them to the Lord. You know, we can have a chokehold on our expectations and we become Job's wife. Or we can submit them to the Lord and we can follow Job's pattern. How did his wife get to that place of refusing to trust the Lord and of rejecting his goodwill for her life? What was going on in her heart that led to her spewing such sinful things? And the interchange between Job and his wife gives us some clues. And then it's in verse 10 of Job chapter 2, where we see Job's completely right and God-honoring response to her venting. He says, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. It's easy to imagine that she may have responded to him with, so? (laughs) Sometimes that's how we respond, isn't it? When someone speaks truth to us, you're speaking foolishly right now. So? You don't know what I've gone through. La, 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 la. And there we go, and we vent our way. To be told you're speaking foolishly may not even sound all that bad. Someone tells you, you're speaking like a foolish woman. Oh, so? That's not that big of a deal. La, 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 la. And then we go off and we're not listening. But to speak like a fool is not really a good idea. In fact, the scriptures tell us um, and paint a, a completely different picture about what foolish speech is like. Numbers 11.1 1 gives us an example. It doesn't actually say that, that they're speaking like a fool, but it gives us an example. In Numbers 11.1, 1, it says this. Now, the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Foolish speech is complaining speech. It's grumbling speech. It's finding fault with God. That's foolishness. That's the example. Proverbs 14.1 records this. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. To speak like a fool is to say, there is no God, so I can do what I want, I can say what I want, and there won't be any consequences for my sins. Curse God and die. That's what Job's wife was saying. There is no God, because if there was, our lives would be. Proverbs 1.7 says that to speak like a fool is to despise wisdom. And to despise wisdom is to reject the counsel of the Lord through his word. It's to say, yeah, but. As soon as we say, yeah, but, we're rejecting the counsel of the Lord. 
and that is foolish. Proverbs 12, 16 says, a fool's anger is known at once. I love that. How do we know that a fool's anger is known at once? Because a fool tells us everything they're thinking. It comes out. It spews. Everyone knows when a fool is angry. I'm so mad. And there they go. This steams me up. Do you understand all the pain and suffering I've gone through? I've had to stand here for 15 minutes. <laughs> Whatever. Don't they know who I am? <laughs> and we hear those things. But sometimes our anger comes out, and everyone hears what we say. And when that is the case, then we are a fool. Proverbs 14, 9 says that fools mock at sin. When someone points out an area of sin in our lives, sometimes we mock at the sin. We minimize it is what we're doing. We explain it away. I am so stressed. I mean, I have tons of finals to study for. I'm totally stressed. That's why I'm eating this way, because I just can't even you know, deal with things. Um, if God knew how busy I was, then he would understand. It's not like I killed anybody. I'm just stressed. I'm, we minimize, don't we? I'm just, I'm just worried. I'm just concerned. I'm just stressed. We minimize it. But it's still just sin, isn't it? Jude 14 through 16 says, fools blame and find fault with God. And in the, the Jude, is, there's a picture of the false teachers and what they're doing. And in verse 15, um, it says that they uh, talk about all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against God. And it says they are grumblers, they find fault, they follow after their own lusts, they speak arrogantly, they flatter people for the sake of gaining advantage. And what we see here in Jude is that unbelievers blame God. They speak against him, they grumble, they find fault with him. And it's an example of what happens when, if we are speaking foolishly or we find fault with God, we are acting like unbelievers. In Job 1, verse 22 it says, Job did not sin or blame God. He didn't sin or blame God. We just looked at, in Jude 14 and through 16, that unbelievers blame God. They find ways to find fault with God. But Job didn't. Blaming God says, you know what is best. Blaming God says, you are the best judge of the situation. Blaming God says he's not righteous, good, or wise, because if he was, then all these things would not have come upon you. Blaming God is a backdoor way of calling God into account for all his actions. It is wicked when we blame God for things. At the heart of foolish speech is a foolish heart that rejects God's sovereignty his wisdom, and his perfect will in ordering and ordaining the lives of men. And that's the difference between Job and his wife. Job affirmed and humbly submitted to God's right to rule and reign as king. Job's wife rejected God's authority. And in doing so, she crossed the line and sinned against the Lord and sought to influence Job to reject God too. If she had believed in God's sovereign right to rule, then she would have bowed low and worshipped. She would have responded like Job. Thomas Brooks says that in the face of God's sovereignty, there should be a prudent and holy silence. This is what we see from Job. He was, he was wise in his responses. He was silent before the Lord. And yet from his wife, there is no prudent and holy silence. We hear her. We hear her loud and clear. Thomas Brooks also said, Men that do not see God in an affliction are easily cast into a feverish fit. They will quickly be in a flame, and when their passions are up, they will begin to be saucy. 
and make no bones of telling God to his face that they do well to be angry. We do not want to be saucy. We do not want to tell God to his face that it's okay if we are angry. Just like Job's wife. That's what she was doing. It's the foolishness of sin. Thomas Brooks goes on to say, When afflictions arrest us, we shall murmur and grumble and struggle until we see that it is God that strikes. We must see him as king of kings and lord and lords and stoop under his almighty majestic hand. Job said in Job 23, verses 13 through 14, The Lord is unique, and who can turn him? And what his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such decrees are with him. Job recognized God's complete sovereignty and right to order all things as he sees fit. Job's understanding of God's power and might and wisdom and holiness is what kept his lips from venting in wickedness. It kept him from speaking foolishly foolishly against the Lord. Psalm 115.3 was written later after Job lived, but he would have still said, this is wise. Psalm 115.3 says, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Why does God do whatever he pleases? Because he's God. He is the creator who rules perfectly in power and might. Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 10 wasn't written when Job was alive, but he would have fully affirmed and assented to its truth. It says, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Job would have agreed with Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4.35 when Nebuchadnezzar said, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, all those statements might be a bit scary about God, especially when we consider God doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants, in whatever way he wants, if God were not also perfectly righteous, if he were not also perfectly holy and good and merciful and wise. God's sovereignty over our lives is also hemmed in by all his other attributes. They all work together at the same time. So though God is sovereign and he, it says that he does whatever he pleases, it's also done in wisdom and love and holiness and righteousness and mercy. Job was at rest because he understood God's character. Job was at rest in the outworking of God's attribute of sovereignty because he also saw God's holiness and his wisdom and his goodness and his mercy. And so that Job was able to say in his sorrow in chapter 1, verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God's sovereignty, kindness, wisdom, and holiness are seen in James 1.17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. We often think of James 1.17 as referring to the tangible things that God gives us, you know, like a Ferrari. <laughs> you know, something good like that. But the verse actually makes no restriction. It doesn't have to be a tangible thing. Every good gift comes down from God. Every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above. So when our circumstances 
come upon us and they're different than we thought they were going to be, they fall into that every good thing given, every perfect gift that is from the Lord. And so we can write in our journals, our, this unmet expectation is a perfect gift from God. When we understand those truths about God's sovereignty, wisdom, kindness, holiness, justice, and mercy, then it puts a guard over our lips and brings us to the place of humble worship. Job certainly understood these truths, which is why he admonished his wife to not speak like a foolish woman. Proverbs 19.3 tells us the, foolish man, the foolishness of man ruins his way and uh, his heart rages against the Lord. And that's what we see from Job's wife. She just raged against the Lord. She was so angry with what was going on in her life. She was like the foolish woman of Proverbs 14.1 who tears down her house with her own hands. If only she had applied Proverbs 9.6 to her heart. Forsake your folly. Live. Proceed in the way of understanding. And that brings us to our second point, which is the key to accepting what comes. Job reproves his wife for speaking so rashly and foolishly, and he asks her, shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Before we get to the point where we can accept both good and ill from the Lord, we need to know and understand God's character. We, and we talked about this already and just in that first point about accepting God's sovereignty, but we want to talk about growing in our understanding of God's goodness toward us. One of the things that I love about David is his understanding of the goodness of God, and we see it through the Psalms. We see how David understood and lived upon that attribute of God while he also rested in God's sovereignty. No matter how D David sinned, and we know that he did, he, uh, he still knew and understood God's complete goodness and faithfulness to keep his promises. In 2 Samuel 24, in verses 10 through 15, um, which is the, the situation where David uh, numbered the people of Israel. He was basically, what he was doing was counting up all the, the fighting men so that he would know um, how strong his army was going to be. And God had said, no, you are not to do this. There were other times when God said that they could take a census to count the people, but in order to find out the strength of the army, that was not to happen. Second Samuel 24.10 says, now David's heart troubled him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to speak to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David. Thus says the Lord, I am offering you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. So this was David's spanking from the Lord. These were the consequences for his sin. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Now, the verse 14 reveals David's reasoning, and this is what puts God's character on display. David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Do not let me fall into the hand of man. So of those three choices that the Lord gave him, only the last one, the one of pestilence, relied completely upon the Lord. And so that's where David went. I'm going to trust in the Lord in this one because I would, I'd rather put myself under God's hand than under man's. The safest place for us to be is in the hand of the Lord. Whatever he gives is always better than anything we could devise to bring relief. That's why Romans 8.28 brings us such comfort, doesn't it? 
We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. This verse helps us to learn to accept what God has ordained in our lives and then helps us to trust him that it's going to be okay. That's what verse, Romans 8.28 teaches us, doesn't it? It's going to be okay. Yet we might feel more like Job's wife than David when we face the unexpected and feel disappointed and discouraged and despairing. We may not like God's plan for us, and we're unwilling to accept it as good or helpful for us. And when we respond like this, even if it's just a short time, what we're really doing is telling the eternal, holy, wise, loving God that we've got a better plan which is a little like, we oftentimes don't think about it, but when we see it as God sees it, then it's like, whoa, I should probably stop speaking. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Israel came up with their own plan for rescue and relief when they didn't like God's plan for them. Isaiah 30 verses 1 and 2 tells us, Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine. And they make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. The Israelites, they came up with their own plan. It's like, well, this is going to be the answer uh, for this. And we, we do this all the time. Um, I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm feeling anxious. So I think I need shopping therapy <laughs> instead of biblical therapy. We, we come up with all kinds of ways to medicate our souls, don't we? We don't have to pop one pill. But we come up with all kinds of things, all kinds of safety nets, all kinds of other ways. We devise our own plans. And the Lord sees it when we don't seek him. Psalm 118 verses 8 and 9 says, It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Now, And in this case, even like trusting in princes, I mean, a prince, who, who's going to help you but a prince? A prince can help anybody. They're the leaders of the land. But God says, no, it's better to trust in me than in princes. The book of Hebrews contains an interesting little tidbit for us and provides some in, insight into why receiving all things from the Lord is good for us. In, in, the author of Hebrews in his final admonition to his readers, he reminds them that trying to earn God's favor through their own efforts is not going to work. And he says in Hebrews 13, 9, don't be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. Tucked away in the middle of Hebrews 13, 9 is this little goodie. And it says, it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened when we trust the Lord, right? When we live by grace, when we live by faith. That's what's good for our hearts. It's not good for our hearts to come up with our own plan. It's not good for our hearts to put our trust in someone else. It's not good for our hearts to, to think that um, if I buy this or if this situation would change or all the little if-only things that we look for. That's not what's going to help our hearts. God says in Hebrews 13, 9, it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. If we look to all those other things to rescue us, it will not benefit us. That's what the author of Hebrews tells us. Matthew Henry said, If we receive so much good for the body, shall we not receive some food for the soul? That is, that is some afflictions by which we partake of God's holiness, something which by saddening the countenance makes the heart better. 
If we're willing to eat, then aren't we willing to receive what God thinks is best for our soul, the food for our soul? That's what he's talking about there. If the Lord saddens our countenance through the difficulties and trials that he brings in our lives, won't that make our hearts better? Yeah, that's what God says. It makes us holy. But we must make a choice about how we're going to respond to the unwelcome unexpected. Margaret Clarkson, in her book, Grace Grows Best in Winter, said, accepting adversity in our lives is initiated by an act of will on our part. We set ourselves to believe in the overruling goodness, providence, and sovereignty of God and refuse to turn aside no matter what may come, no matter how we may feel. William Garnall said, Faith will not harbor unworthy thoughts of God in the heart. If your view of God is shaped by scripture, it, will, it is impossible to have anything but holy and loyal thoughts of God. Satan seeks to encourage hard thoughts of God when his providence is hard to understand. There's so many things in our lives that we don't understand. And Satan wants us to think badly of God. Gernal goes on to say, Something, some have questioned God's judgment, justice, because he does not judge speedily. Others have questioned his care and faithfulness in not providing better for his servants or in allowing their afflictions. Satan seeks for us to view God through these broken glasses. Job, when he spoke to his wife, you speak as a foolish woman, he quenched this dart, Gernal says. What God takes from me is less than I owe him, and what he leaves me is more than I deserve. Unbecoming thoughts or words about God are the product of a rash and hasty spirit. It is fitting for Christians to bless God in the saddest condition that can befall them. Faith finds mercy in the greatest affliction and in the saddest mixture of providence. Praise God for past mercies, and it will not be long before you have a new song in your mouth for the present mercy. This is exactly what Paul did in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. When Paul was uh, being afflicted, and he had the, his, the thorn in his flesh, and he desired God to take it away, and God said, no, it is better for you um, that you continue to live with this. The Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And Paul's response then to the Lord's will for him was, most gladly, therefore, Lord, I will boast about my weakness. Oh, how are you guys doing? Are you feeling a little weak? <laughs> Boasting? <laughs> Why did he want to boast about his weakness? So that the power of Christ would dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses. I'm so content with insults. I love my distresses. I am content with persecution. I'm content with difficulty. Who said that? Never. <laughs> but Paul did. I'm well content with difficulties. We want it to be easy. And why was he? Because it was for Jesus' sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is just exactly what Job told his wife. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? They're saying the same thing, Paul and Job. And that brings us to our last point, preparing your soul for the unexpected. In Job 2.10, it says, In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I think this is monumental. Think about all the pressures. We, don't, we actually don't even know how long the time frame is um, that they went through uh, this trial. But think about the pressures, the sorrow, the heightened emotions, the level of rejection that Job was suffering, um, the physical affliction, all of that. The temptation to sin, to just even let out one little, was, it must have been so great. And yet in all this, 
Job did not sin with his lips. How? <laughs> How didn't he sin? <laughs> the book of Job gives us some clues. In verse 10, we see Job's commitment not to sin against the Lord by speaking rashly and foolishly like his wife. He had just talked to her about don't speak rashly or foolishly. So he had a commitment in his own heart. I will not sin with my lips. No matter what. He did not sin. Do you know that we have a choice not to sin? Sometimes we, I think we forget that. Sometimes it feels like I just couldn't help myself. But 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us no temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure whatever you're going through. We can learn to look for the way of escape when we're tempted to vent, when we're tempted to speak rashly, when we're tempted to lose our temper or grow bitter or despairing or any of the other things that we deal with in our lives. Now, you might not necessarily be aware right at that moment um, where, that, where you move from temptation to sin. Tem uh, the temptation of where that line is is different in all of us, and, and we need to assess our own hearts. That's why we're called to examine our own hearts in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to see where we've stepped over from temptation into sin. But we, there is a, a line. There's a place when we're tempted to sin, and then there's that moment when we decide, I'm just giving in. I'm just going for it. I'm just going to say it. Or whatever it is. And we, we turn. I'm not going to forgive. I'm going to keep this. All, any of those kinds of things. Psalm 17.3 speaks to our commitment to not sin and to look for a way of escape. It says, you have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you find nothing. Why? because I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. Now you might hear um, in Psalm 17, verse 3, I have purposed that I will not sin and think that it's all about gritting it out. Like, I'm not going to do it, and I'm not going to give in, and I'm going to be strong in my power and in my might, which never works. I'm sure you've tried it. I have. Doesn't work, does it? Um, anything that is me-centered, anything that where it's all about me being strong and I'm not going to do this anymore, um, that me-centered sanctification isn't anything that will ever produce anything good in our lives. We want to purpose not to sin by leaning on the strength of Jesus Christ, who held out against sin all the way to the cross. And because Jesus didn't sin, we now have a choice. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a choice not to fall into sin. Now, will we sin? Yes. But as we grow in Christ, we're going to sin less, and we will be quicker to identify when we fall into sin. But we're never going to be, come to the end of sin until we are made perfect in heaven. But there will, there will be growth. We're going to be growing in maturity. We have a choice not to sin, but we have to look for the way of escape. Resisting sin and temptation is spirit-given, and it's a skill we can develop in our new life in Jesus Christ. It's not about just say no. It's not about having enough self-control. The control that we want is Jesus' control. Lord, I need your strength. My control isn't worth a hill of beans. My control is nothing. I need yours 
your control in my life. And it's about submitting our hearts, our lives, our, the inner workings of our hearts to the Lord and leaning on him for grace and strength. One of the things that we see about Job is um, when his wife talked to him in verse 9, she leveled at him, do you still hold fast your integrity? And one of the things that Job did is in the, in the years and the days coming up to all their trials, Job was a man of integrity. He was a spiritual prepper. He had prepared his heart to live with integrity all the days of his life. And so when trials had come upon them, then his wife was said, are you still going to maintain that? Are you still going to live like you've always lived? I mean, look at our lives. It's a mess. And so she pitched whatever integrity had been in her heart and in her life. But Job didn't. He maintained his integrity. He held fast to his integrity, and that's why he didn't sin with his lips. The trials, the suffering, the sorrow, and unmet expectations that he had experienced didn't change anything for him. He kept living the way he'd always been living. He continued to believe what he'd always believed, and he responded with faith and trust just like he's always done. He maintained his integrity. One of the things that he, he said is in chapter 27, in verses 5 and 6, is um, Job was getting a little worn out. But he said, far be it from me that I should declare you right, he's talking to his friends, till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach any of my days. I'm not going to start living wickedly now. I will not put away my integrity. I am going to live like I have always lived. I will not uh, say evil against the Lord. Psalm 26.1 says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Psalm 41.12 says, As for me, you uphold me in my integrity, and you set me in your presence forever. Integrity is a, pow- a pattern of life that is firmly anchored in God. Our integrity builds the walls around us, around us that keep us protected from temptation so that we will not give in to sin. Our integrity is developed in living upon and obeying God's word. It is to live a life that's lined up with the scriptures, and then uh, we continue to apply when life gets hard. Integrity is a life that explains the doctrines of God, and Job held fast to his integrity. It was the way he had always lived, and he wasn't going to change now. Job understood the cost of what it meant to let go of his integrity. What if, he, what if he would have just responded like his wife? I mean, we wouldn't have the rest of the book of Job and all those wonderful lessons that we learn. He understood what it meant if he, he let go of that code of conduct. And we need to understand that too. That if, if we sin with our lips, if we're rash, if we vent then we're not going to go through the trials and the difficulties and the unmet expectations of life without sinning. We're going to give way. But if if you are living by God's word today and God brings trials upon you tomorrow, then you're going to continue if you've purposed in your heart to not sin. We want to hold fast and pay attention Matthew Henry said, Job, in the midst of all of his grievances, did not speak a word amiss, but also preserved a good temper of mind, so that though there might be some stirrings and risings of corruptions in his heart, yet grace got the upper hand, and he took care that the root of bitterness might not spring up to trouble him. 
I love how Matthew Henry said that. Grace got the upper hand. Isn't that beautiful? <clears throat> when we're tempted to say something we shouldn't, to lash out, to um, be angry against the Lord, grace needs to get the upper hand. And so we want to be on guard against these things so that we can respond like Job rather than Job's wife. Looking at Job and his wife helps us see that our expectations can lead to foolishness in us, but it doesn't have to. Our expectations might cause us or lead us to responding or may even cause us to be tempted to respond foolishly, but we don't have to. We can be Job's. We can accept good and adversity from God equally. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By preparing our souls for the unexpected before disappointments, trials, and delays come upon us. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of Job and his wife. And we want to come before you and confess any sins of foolish speech. Lord, we want to come before you and confess how tempted we are to give way to sin. Lord, we want to thank you that you always provide a way of escape. Lord, we thank you for the strength that you supply. Lord, you are so worthy to be followed because you only give what is good. And though we may label it as bad, you haven't labeled it that way, Lord. It is only good. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing. We thank you for your holy ways that you desire to refine us, that you desire to sanctify us, that you desire us to look like Jesus. We pray for anyone who's struggling here. Lord, I ask that you would strengthen her heart for any who might not know you. May today be the day that she comes to you and repenting of her sin begins the new life in Jesus where there's a choice not to sin with our lips any longer that we could be like Job and accept good from you and adversity we pray this in Jesus name amen amen let's all stand and respond in worship Strange and
So I was worshiping over there with you, and I was thinking to myself, this is like a foretaste of heaven. You sounded amazing. And I was thinking, we are going to be worshiping Christ forever together like this. Amazing. Sounded so good. Well, what a blessing to just sit in the word of God, to be able to, to let the truth of God's word lead us and guide us. The Bible says that Scripture is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It helps us to navigate through what is ultimately a dark and fallen world, right? It's God's creation. It's beautiful, but it's not our home. And so by God's grace, we have the Word to guide us, and we have Lisa to be able to walk us through what she's been teaching tonight, and there's more to come tomorrow. Um, So it's been such a sweet night. Colleen? Yes, I have some announcements. Um, A couple things. Bring your lanyards tomorrow. Wear those. Those are uh, your name badge. We'll know. Security will know you belong here on campus. Don't forget to submit your questions for Lisa in the Q&A session tomorrow via the QR code or your QR code friend that you made today. (laughs) Breakfast starts nice and early at 7.30 a.m., okay? 7.30. The conference starts at 8.30, so the session will actually start 8.30 on the dot in here, breakfast 7.30 in there, and you will need your coffee for all of that tomorrow, right? So we have you covered. Don't worry. We have pour-overs at Coronado Coffee. We have a coffee truck coming tomorrow. We have some lattes. Uh, Bring your money for that and bring your money for the pour-overs. And we have our high-quality church coffee available for free as well, (laughs) which I love, by the way. All right. Uh, All of that to say, come early, and we'll have the caffeine. And by the way... By the way, so to all of you that were ushered in back in here by me and others, first of all, it wasn't fair to you to give you a, okay, here we go, charcuterie, all right? Shauna, wherever you're at, I nailed it, I think, I think. 
So anyways, to give you 15 minutes to work your way through that probably wasn't fair, so we're going to figure that out tomorrow. So thank you for making your way back in. We really appreciate that. Um, so let me go ahead and pray and close our time before the Lord. Father, thank you so much for, uh, for this time. I thank you that you are so gracious, so kind and merciful. Father, thank you that you gave up everything. You gave up your son for us. And so, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, will we continue to lay down our expectations before you? And Lord, I pray that you would help us to draw ever closer to you, to walk closely with you, to trust you no matter what. Father, I pray that as we continue to think through our unmet expectations, I pray that your spirit would continue to use your eternal, perfect word to renew our minds and transform us more into the image of Jesus. I thank you for these women. I thank you for the fact that they are here, that we get to worship you together. We get to fellowship together, break bread together, pray together. Lord, it is a foretaste of heaven. And so we thank you for this opportunity, and we pray that you would do it again tomorrow. Lord, we pray for your hand of protection and blessing for tomorrow when you continue to help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are released. God bless.